You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome. If you know Mary, you know Jesus. Hello to everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni, and I thank all of you for joining me today. Uh, the previous show that we have done was uh, based on St. Alphonsus's the, on the Glories of Mary. And we're going to go through the seven sorrows. I'm going to pick up from here and continue with our meditations on all seven of Our Lady's sorrows. But just for a brief um, synopsis of what that is, the first sorrow is the prophecy of Simeon. So all of these sorrows are, fund- are basically in Scripture or implied there at least. So the first sorrow is the prophecy of Simeon. The second is the flight into Egypt. Joseph and Mary flight into Egypt when Herod threatened to uh, kill the Christ child. The third sorrow is the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. Joseph and Mary sought him sorrowing for three days. The four sorrows when Jesus meets Mary on the way of the cross. Of course, Scripture speaks of Mary accompanying him, and I'm sure she met him several times, or at least once as implied through tradition on the way of the cross. The fifth sorrow, of course, is the crucifixion and death of our Savior, and Our Lady is there suffering, all of that witnessing the death of her Son and all, that, and all of his tortures. The, the sixth sorrow is when the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross and placed in our loving, our sorrowful mother's arms. And the seventh saw, of course, is the burial of Jesus. And Our Lady witnessed all of these things and in anticipation for his glorious resurrection from the dead. So those are the mysteries we're going to meditate on. And today begins the first sorrow, the prophecy of Simeon. The first saw, the prophecy of Simeon. And uh, just before we begin, I, I invite all to listen to my previous show. I think it was number 225, and it was the introduction to Our Lady Sorrows. But St. Alphonsus Liguori describes why Mary is the queen of martyrs. And I think you'll find it very interesting, and it'll be a great uh, way to introduce us into Our Lady Seven Sorrows to help us understand what she actually went through. So I invite all to everyone listening, if you can, to listen to my previous show, previous to this one. So as always, let's begin with a prayer to Our Lady just to uh, help us and guide us. Dear Immaculate Mother, we invite you, as always, and we love you so much. We ask you to surround us all and protect us with your heavenly mantle of grace, with all the holy angels and saints, those in purgatory. Dear Mother, please guide this show and uh, obtain for us the grace to open our hearts and minds to all that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. St. Louis de Montfort says, Happy indeed, sublimely happy are those souls whom the Holy Spirit imparts the true knowledge about you, Mary. So we are seeking that knowledge so that that we can become happy indeed to know all about you and all that God wants to teach us. St. Joseph, Tear of Demons, beloved husband and father, we beg you in your intercession, in your prayers to guide us in that attempt. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So from here, the first sorrow, the prophecy of Simeon, and I will, from this point on, let St. Alphonsus speak in the way that he does best. So these are his writings on that sorrow. Suffering is everyone's lot in this valley of tears, and all of us must put up with the evils and miseries that are our daily occurrence. Yet how much more vexatious life would be if we knew what was in store for us. Unhappy would that man be, says Seneca, who knew what the future would bring and would have to suffer all the more by anticipation. God is merciful, but not allowing us to foresee the crosses that are in store for us. It is a blessing that whatever it is we have to endure, we have to suffer it only once. But he was not so compassionate toward Mary. He willed that she should be queen of sorrows in all things like his son. And so Mary was obliged to have continually before her, before her eyes, all the torments that awaited her. 
especially her participation in sufferings of the passion and death of her beloved Jesus. In the temple, St. Simeon had received a divine child in his arms and predicated that this child would be a symbol of contradiction and persecution for all people. Behold, this child is set for a sign which shall be contradicted. Then he added that dreadful prophecy, and your own soul a sword shall pierce. Luke 2, verses 34 through 35. The Blessed Virgin told St. Matilda that when St. Simeon pronounced these words, all her joy was changed into sorrow. For as was revealed to St. Teresa, although Mary already knew that the sacrifice for the salvation of the world, she then received a more explicit knowledge and learned in greater detail what sufferings and what a cruel death awaited him. She knew that he would be persecuted and opposed in every way. He would be opposed in his teaching instead of being believed. He would be called a blasphemer, proclaiming to be the Son of God. The reprobate Caiaphas was to say, He has blasphemed. He is guilty of death. Matthew 26, verse 65 and 66. He would be opposed in his reputation, that though he was a noble, even royal lineage, he was despised as a nobody. It is this the isn't this is not this the carpenter's son? Matthew thirteen verse fifty five. Is not this the carpenter's son, the son of Mary? Mark six verse three. He was wisdom itself. It was treated as an ignoramus. How did this man know letters, having known never learned? John 7, verse 15. As a false prophet, and they bifolded him and smote his face, saying, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? Luke 24, verse 64. He was treated as a madman, an ignoramus. He is mad. Why do you hear him? Found in John 10, verse 20. As a drunkard, a drunkard and a glutton, a friend of sinners. Behold, a man that is a glutton and a drinker of wine, a friend of publicans and sinners. Luke 7, verse 34. As a sorcerer, by the prince of devils, he casts out devils. Matthew 9, verse 34. As a heretic and one possessed by the evil spirit. Do we not say well of you that you are a Samaritan and has a devil? John 8, verse 48. In short, Jesus was considered so notoriously wicked that as the Jews said to Pilate, no trial was necessary to condemn him. If he were not a malefactor, we would not have him delivered up to you. John 18, verse 30. He was opposed even in his very soul for his own eternal father in order to meet the demands of divine justice, opposed him by refusing to hear his prayer when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Matthew 26, verse 39. His father abandoned him to fear, weariness, and sadness, so much so that Jesus exclaimed, My soul is sorrowful unto death. Matthew 26, verse 38. His inner sufferings even caused him to sweat blood. In a word, he was persecuted and tortured in body and in soul in every way until finally, drained of every drop of his blood, he expired. An object of scorn on a cross of shame. When David, in the midst of his pleasure and regal splendor, heard from the prophet Nathan that his son would die, 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 14, he could not be consoled. He wept, fasted, and slept on the ground. Mary, on the other hand, received with with the greatest calm the announcement that her son would die. She submitted to it peacefully. 
Yet what grief she must have suffered, living daily in the presence of this devoted son, hearing from him the words of eternal life, edified day after day by his sacred conduct. Abraham had much to suffer during the three days that he spent with his beloved Isaac after he learned that he was to lose him. But, oh God, it was not for thir- three days, but for 33 years that Mary had to endure a similar sorrow. A similar sorrow. It was far greater sorrow inasmuch as Mary's son was infinitely more lovable than the son of Abraham. The Blessed Virgin revealed to St. Bridget that when she was on earth, there was not a moment that this sorrow did not pierce her soul. Whenever I looked at my son, she said, whenever I wrapped him in his swaddling clothes, whenever I saw his hands and feet, my soul was enveloped in grief, for I realized that he would be crucified. The abbot Rupert contemplates Mary nursing her child and saying to him, My lover is for me a sachet of myrrh to rest in my bosom. Canticle chapter 1, verse 12. Ah, my son, I clasp you in my arms because you are so dear to me. But the more I love you, the more you become a source of sorrow to me when I think of all that you will have to suffer. According to St. Bernardine of Siena, Mary realized that he who was the strength of the saints was to be reduced to agony. He who was the beauty of paradise would be disfigured. The Lord of the world would be bound as a criminal. The creator of all things would be made livid with blows. The judge of all would be condemned. The glory of heaven would be despised. The king of kings would be crowned with thorns and treated as an imposter. Father Engelgrave says that it was also revealed to St. Bridget that our afflicted mother already aware what her son was to suffer. Thought of the gall and vinegar when he when she suckled him, of the cords that would bind him when she swathed him, of the cross to which she would be nailed when she carried him in her arms, of his death when he slept. Whenever she dressed him, she reflected that his clothes would one day be torn from him so that he could be crucified. And when she gazed at his sacred hands and feet, she thought of the nails that would one day pierce them. Then as Mary told St. Bridget, my eyes filled with tears and my heart was tortured with grief. The evangelist that as Jesus grew older, let me back up, the evangelist says that as Jesus grew older, he, was, he also advanced in wisdom and in grace with God and men. Taken from Luke 2, verse 52. St. Thomas explains this as meaning that Jesus advanced in wisdom and grace in the eyes of men in as far as their opinion of him was concerned. He advanced before God in the sense that all his actions would have suffice to increase his merit continually if he had not been for the fact that all grace had been conferred upon him in its complete fullness from the beginning by virtue of the hypostatic union. But if Jesus advanced in the love and esteem of others, how much more must Mary have grown to love him? Yet, at the same time that her love increased, all the more did her soul increase at the thought of having to lose him by such a cruel death. The nearer the time of his passion approached, the more deeply the sword of sorrow foretold by Simeon pierced the heart of his mother. An angel revealed this in so many words to St. Bridget when he told her, That sort of sorrow approached the Blessed Virgin hour by hour as the time for the passion of her son drew near. It is most reasonable, therefore, that since our King and his Holy Mother did not refuse to suffer the most cruel pains throughout the life for our sake, 
we at least should not complain if we too have to suffer something. Jesus crucified once appeared to the Dominican sister Magdalene Orsini, who had long been suffering under a great trial. He encouraged her to remain within him on the cross, to remain with him on the cross by bearing her affliction. But Sister Magdalene objected and said complainingly, O oh Lord, you were tortured on the cross for only three hours, but I have endured my pain for many years. The Redeemer replied, O oh, ignorant soul, you do not know what you are saying. From the first moment of my conception, I suffered in my heart everything that I would have to endure later on while dying on the cross. When we are in the mood to complain for our sufferings, let us picture Jesus and his mother Mary addressing the same words to us. And that's the end of the meditation. And from here, St. Alphonsus goes on to the example he gives in support of his words. He says, Father Griglion, S.J., tells how a young man accustomed to visit daily a statue of Our Lady of Sorrows on which Mary was represented with seven swords piercing her heart. One night, the youth unfortunately committed a mortal sin. The next morning, going as usual to visit the statue, he noticed that there were no longer only seven, but now eight swords in the heart of Mary. Wondering at this, he heard a voice telling him that it was his sin that added the eighth sword. He was so moved by this that he immediately went to confession and through the intercession of his heavenly advocate recovered divine grace. The end of his meditation, or his example, I should say. And this is his prayer on the first sorrow, the prophecy of Simeon, according to St. Alphonsus Liguori. He says, O blessed mother, I have not pierced your heart with one sword alone but with as many as are the number of sins I have committed. O lady, is it not you who are innocent who ought to suffer? It is not you who are innocent who ought to suffer, but I who am guilty of so many crimes. But since you have suffered so much for me, obtain for me by your merits great sorrow for my sins and patience in the trials of this life. These are bound to be light in comparison with my crimes, by which I have so often deserved hell. Amen. And I hope all that are listening prayed that prayer sincerely from the heart. As I prayed that, it's a very powerful prayer. And you can see St. Alphonsus Liguori, he suffered uh, many uh, sorrows or many sufferings that a lady suffered. And um, he also looked to her for the strength to endure all the trials because he saw, as St. Peel tells us, so many great things that happen to our sufferings that God wants to do for us. It is only through the cross that we can rise from glory to glory. So great benefit to our souls. If you're like me, I'm not one who particularly likes suffering all that much. I admit it. I'm weak in my sufferings, but I look to Our Lady of Sorrows and I look to the great grace of our merciful Savior, Jesus, who will help me carry that cross that is so vital for us to arrive at our ultimate end in God, the beatific vision. So that is my prayer for all today. Thank you for listening. I hope you tune in to the next sorrow, which is the second sorrow, is the flight of Jesus into Egypt. And we'll hear from the words of the great saint, St. Alphonsus Liguori, and let him teach us on Our Lady's uh, sor- uh, Seven Sorrows. And uh, until next time, uh, I will end with this prayer. May Our Lady of Sorrows, in union with the heart of Joseph and the sorrowful heart of our beloved Savior Jesus, may she obtain for us from, from his merciful heart all the graces necessary to help us grow in the virtue that is necessary to become more like Christ in virtue 
and all of his mannerisms and all that he taught so that we can be transformed into other Christ, perfectly pleasing to the Father. And Jesus teaches us, be perfect as your Father, and heaven is perfect. To become like Jesus is to become perfect like the Father. In Jesus' holy name, I pray this for myself and all of you listening. Amen. God bless you all. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.